When we start learning the Arabic language, it seems like a real puzzle. And, uh, but I understand that. Because you don't know the rules yet. If you were to approach any kind of puzzle, you don't know the rules, you don't know how it, how it balances itself out. How are you supposed to? How are you supposed to understand how it works? How are you supposed to understand all of its bits and bobs? Yeah, you can't. But we need the grammar. We need the rules. And that's why it's grammar time. Assalamu alaikum everybody, this is your Arabic teacher Sam. I pray that you guys are very, very well in the best of health and I hope you're ready to get into the penultimate lesson of grammar time. Before we get stuck in, I need to inform you all, we only have two days left for you to come on board the Arabic in 60 Steps program before Arabic in 60 Steps 2.0 is launched. So that program will be closing. And in fact, I only have 13 books left. Um, so there are only 13 spaces left. So um, we've already got, you know, already there have been 20 odd students sign up in the last couple of days. And um, so the books are going away quickly. So please get yourself in if you're on the fence or anything, you've been considering it for a long time. Uh, don't delay anymore. OK, come on board, inshallah. Link will be in the description below. And without further ado, let's get into grammar time. So uh, obviously, episode nine, this is kind of going to be like a double barreled episode. This week, we're doing two episodes. We can do one today and we're doing one tomorrow and tomorrow will be the last one ever. Okay. I think 10 episodes of grammar time is enough. I think 50 um, common mistakes that beginner Arabic students make is enough for this series. So we'll be ending it and we'll perhaps replace it with something else. So the first thing, uh, the first mistake, okay, first mistake of the day is to do with, is to do with what we call nida. Nida. You know, a lot of you have seen nida, although you might not know that it's called nida. And it's when you say, yeah, there are some other other ways that you do it, but most of the way that we're familiar with is when we say yeah to someone. And you know, when we use yeah, it's a way of us knowing that you're addressing someone directly. You know, traditionally and classically in Arabic, if you were to just say Muhammad, really you'd, people would assume that you're talking about Muhammad in the third person, okay? But if you say yeah, Muhammad, you know, that's how we'd know that you're addressing someone called Muhammad. And uh, there's a little mistake with this because there are some rules where quite often we will have yeah, and if there's an ildafa afterwards, something like Ya Amir al Mu'minin, for example, O oh, like O oh, leader of the, the believers or commander of the believers. Ya Amir al Mu'minin. Ya Amir al Mu'minin. So that that's that's what we do, right? We do have a fatha on there and we see this a lot of the time. But people often assume that you do that even when it's not. Um, and Adafa, people often assume wrongly. And they say things like, yeah, Muhammad, yeah, Muhammad. But you should not have Muhammad. If it's just a name, it's yeah, Muhammadu. Uh, normally, Muhammad can be Muhammadun. Muhammad isn't a name which is Mamnur and Asarf. But in this case, when you use yeah, you, you treat it as if it was singular. Um, yeah, yeah, Muhammadu, or yeah, Waladu, or yeah, Rajulu. You know, you, you treat it as if it was. Um, definitely, you just don't have the elephant and the lamb at the beginning. So that's the first mistake, which is very common, which I spotted this week. Second mistake. Um, second mistake is there are five nouns in Arabic which don't express their case in the conventional way. You know, normally when we express case, we express morfor with a dhamma, we express mansur with a fatha, and we, and we express majrur with a kasra. Okay, that's normally how we do it. Okay, there are there are exceptions to that, but that's kind of the baseline rule. There are five nouns which um, express their case with a long vowel. And the example that we're going to talk about today is the word abu. Okay? We know that eb, we know that abun is a father. We know that, right? But um, but abu um, is if it's morfur. Okay? Aba is if it's monsoul. Aba. And then we also have abi. Abi. For the majrur, right? That's kind of how we express it with eb. You know, there, there, there are there are some others. We don't need to go over all of them, but but that's why ach is like that too. So you sometimes have achu, achuka, achaka, or achika. You 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 have it with all of those. There are some others as well, but we don't need to go into those now. There are three others. Um, you know, the the example that I spotted is um is when a student said li li Abu Bakr, li Abu Bakr, li Abu Bakrin, yeah. Li Abu Bakrin. So um, if you're going to have li, then it makes this majrur. We'd say li Abi Bakr. Li Abi Bakr. And that's also why you might have had aba. Like when, if, if, you know, to talk about the previous mistake, using ya, like the name Abu Bakr is an idafa name, right? So we would say ya Aba Bakr. 
you know, if you're calling out yeah to someone who is an ab, um, it will become abba rather than abu or abi. So even like, you know, I've been at the masjid sometimes. Obviously, my son's called Yusuf. So people in Arabic will refer to me as Abu Yusuf. But if you call out to me, you say, yeah, abba Yusuf. Yeah, yeah, abba Yusuf. Cool. Okay, so that's the second one. Okay, just remember that that is one of the nouns which which changes um, from abu to abba or abi. Very nice. I like that one. Uh, next one. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is this is quite a sticky one actually. Um, it's about passive passive patterns for derived forms of verbs. So normally when we learn the passive, right? Usually when we learn the passive, we learn that the past tense is kind of like this. I'll just demonstrate with the verb katebe becomes kutiba. So that means like it was written, right? Kutiba. And in the present tense becomes yuktebu. Yuktebu. Okay, kutiba and yuktebu. But when students get to derived forms of verbs, let's say for example, let's take the verb um, iqtaraha. Iqtaraha, one of my favorite verbs. Iqtaraha, meaning to suggest. To suggest something. So how do we make that? You know, how do we put this u'i'a, kutiba, into for iqtaraha? You know, there's not only three letters in it. You know I mean, and a lot of students make the common mistake of, of just trying to stick the kasra in the middle somewhere to have like iqti, iqti, like uqti, uqti raha, uqti raha. And actually that's, that's very nearly right. It's very nearly right. But really the rule which, which I teach when we get to more, when we get to derived forms isn't that it's just u'i'a in the past tense. It's a dhamma on the beginning. So we are going to have uq, uq, ter, uq. And then we are on the penultimate letter. On the penultimate letter, we'll have our kasra. Uqtariha. And that's the passive. Uqtariha. And we apply the same rules um, for the active, but instead of instead of a kasra on the penultimate letter, a fatha. Right? And that's the only difference. So, so whereas in the active, okay, this is the active. Iqtaraha. Yaqtarihu. Yaqtarihu. It's a useful verb, actually. A suggestion is an iqtirah. Um, in the passive, um, it would just be yuk, yuk tarahu. That's the only difference. Yuk tarahu. Yeah, that that's the passive. Like it is being suggested or something, or you know, it is it is suggested. Uktariha, uktariha. And that's how we do the passives in the derived forms. It's not so hard with the form two, because you just have a shedder in the middle to deal with. Um, yeah, you just have a shedder in the middle to deal with, and it you know it's not it doesn't really change the pattern at all. But when we start adding other letters in and then other derived forms, then uh, then it does make a difference. Um, number four, number four. Um, Okay, we are only doing four actually in this episode. We're going to do four in the next episode as well. Okay, the last two episodes only have four mistakes, but it's still cool. So this is one about fractions, about numbers. You know, numbers are numbers are just quite tricky, really. So you know, a lot of these episodes we have at least had something to do with numbers in them. But this 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 one's to do with fractions. Usually, when we create a fraction of a word, we take or of a number rather, we take the number. So for example, thaleth, thalethun. And if we want to make a third, then we just put it into this pattern. We put it into the furlun pattern. So we end up with thulthun. A thulth. Thulthun. Okay. Thulthun means a third, right? And we do the same with arba becomes a rubrun. A quarter is a rubr. Um, those are really useful for, for knowing how to tell the time, by the way. In Arabic, you do say... You do say and a third. In English, we say 20 past or 22, but in, in Arabic, you can say, you know, wathulth or illa thulth. Okay, so what's the mistake that I'm talking about? The mistake here really is one that most students would realize if they had a little look at English first. And that's that, you know, we take the number two, take the number two, if nani, okay, root letters are, you know, fair, noon, and yeah, probably, you know, fenni, fenia. You know, I think it's probably fair, fair, noon and yeah. Never looked it up, but that sounds right to me. And try to make a try to make a fraction, like a tooth, a tooth of something, as in like thun thunion. You know, a lot of students try to do this and make like thun thunion. Okay, have a little look at English. Okay, we don't say a tooth. We say a half. We say a nisf. We say a nisfun. 
Okay, that, that's the word for half in Arabic, okay? Don't, don't, don't try to make a, a tooth of something, um, just like we make a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth of something. Um, you just use the word nisf, as in a half. Be aware, let's, let's take a little journey to um, Amiya land. Um, Amiya land, isn't it? We say grammar town, Amiya land. In Amiya land, they don't say nisfun, they say nus, nus. They say nus, nus. If something's like half and half, nus, nus, um, nus, nus. Uh, yeah, but Nusfun is uh, it really confused me actually. Once we, a friend of mine and I were in Jordan and we were ordering chicken. We were ordering like a half chicken. He came and asked us Nusayin. He said Nusayin. Like, do you want to to Nus? Like, my friend would have understood if he said Nus Nusfaini, Helatori Dani Nus Nusfaini or something. Do do the two of you want two halves? Because talking about a half chicken, right? We each wanted a half chicken. Yeah, but my, my friend thought that it was like a Chinese because it's nis, nisin. Nisin means like China. <laughs> so, so he thought it was like a Chinese, like a Chinese, I don't know, a Chinese marinade or something on the chicken <laughs> or whatever. But but anyways, anyways, so yeah, but nisfun is the way we say half. And that is everything for this week's episode of Grammar Time. Get yourself in the Arabic in 60 Steps program now or delay it till tomorrow if you really want to risk it for a biscuit because uh, the books might have been gone by then. But um, yeah, so that's it. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Come come back tomorrow, inshallah, for the last ever episode of Grammar Time, episode 10. Hope you're looking forward to it. See you guys then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.